At six foot two, built in typical Dutch fashion, and being one of the best chefs in the world on top of that, I have to say I've always been a little terrified of him. My fears aside, and very much unwarranted, he's always been approachable, and despite a hectically busy schedule, he's always made time to get involved in community projects, especially for a good cause. Today we get up close and pretty personal with Richard Ekebis. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Good. You've been a chef for a long time. Um, has there ever been any doubts as to your career? Because it, in my mind, you're one of those individuals that would have done very well at anything you do. Mm. Well, I, I think that I, uh, I, was, I, was, I was trying to become a, an engineer and I w went to, to, uh, to make sure that I was pursuing that path. But um, somewhere along the line, by working in a restaurant, it sort of persuaded me that that was really my my, my, my true um, uh, destiny. And, uh, and then I think unconsciously, I think it came through that, you know, being raised in a, in, with grandparents, being into the trade, it was sort of unnatural that I was being prepped from a very early age to eventually work in hospitality. So uh, I, I get the natural uh, apprentice scheme. And has there ever been a time where you even now, as one of the best chefs in the world, have said, this is too difficult, I wish I'd have done something different? Mm. Uh, I don't think so. I think it doesn't matter. I always say it doesn't matter in, in what you want to be successful. If you want to be the best, you will need to work harder than anybody else because talent is not always enough. So, um, no, no. I mean, do, do you have days that you're less motivated than others? Yeah, sure. But I think we're now coming into a stratosphere that you cannot permit yourself, letting yourself down by, by that feeling. So you need to be on top of your game every day. Sure. And what do you find the most challenging in your day? Um, the fact that there's only 24 hours in them, uh, that is probably the only one. And you're working 18 on um, average? Yeah, well, yeah, there, there's a quite extensive amount of hours I, I, I'm busy. Yeah. Sure. And the pressure, how did you manage to learn to deal with that, especially at the level that you, yeah. you're now playing at? Um, I mean, this is a question that is probably m most asked to me. How do you deal with the pressure? And I don't, I, I build my own pressure and um, it's, it's, I do not get pressure by any reward or recognition ultimately I think it's the guests that set the pressure on a daily basis with their expectations uh, that the expectations are getting higher by the amount of accolades we get that's a fact so that's why I built my own pressure but more from internally with my internal in dissatisfaction about how we do things and how we can do you know improve things and how can we make things work better and, and I have I think my real focus is not just about the food it's about the overall experience so I'm very attention to detail driven and, very, very tedious and sometimes very difficult to work with. Okay, so on, on accolades and awards, so if, um, if we use the analogy that musicians have the Grammys and actors have Oscars, what would, in your mind, be the ultimate I've arrived moment for a chef in terms of an accolade? Well, I think that that is already not possible. You know, I have arrived, it doesn't exist in our trades. You know, it's a real, uh, I think those who think that they have arrived that are already on their way out. So, um, no, I'm very humbled by, by the amount of accolades and I think it's tremendous for the team and the team does work very hard and they do not get the same sort of um, exposure as I do. So I get a different re reward than they do, but they are the engine room and they put in the hours and the effort and the commitment and for them it's very important. I think it's for them way more important than it is for me. And do, you, do you think awards um, and accolades affect you or the business in any sort of way? Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, there's no, you know, when we got two stars, of course, it put Amber on the map. You know, um, it put Amber on the map on a very international scale. Um, then we got into 50 best and, you know, that put Amber you know, through a different angle, you know, and, and every list or every rating is debatable and everybody has their own opinion, which, which is fine, you know, and, and I think it should open debate, these, these listings. But, um, yeah, they have made a tremendous impact on business because, you know, at times we would have months that are work, that would be a little bit busy, we're a little bit quieter, uh, in August or July, you know, cities traditionally where Hong Kong people flee the city and go on holiday. And that now has re replaced itself by people basically coming to the city. Because, you know, people always focus on what they'd have done for the restaurant, Michelin, but what did it do for the city? It, it put the city on, on, a, on a marble pedestal. And, and I think it's been tremendous for uh, Hong Kong to be the second city in Asia to be 
you know, listed with a Michelin guide. So for the city, it's been very, it's been really making this city a very legit food city, international food city. And 50 best, of course, is, is extremely important and it drives bookings, no, no question. I mean, our reservation system crashed and our website crashed on the day that we entered the 50 best. Wow. Now, all of a sudden you had get 25,000 hits a month on your website, which you would not have. That's incredible. But, and you know, a lot of those hits coming from overseas or internally? Yeah, internally and overseas. It's, it's very evenly distributed, you know, and sometimes from very funny areas, you know. Uh, so it's, it's interesting. And in your career as a chef, you've had um, some very interesting moments and in previous discussions you've had, you've, you've um, cooked for royalty. Yep. Um, what would you say the highlight of your career so far has been? Um, well, there's, there's many. Uh, you mean in terms of who I cooked for? or, or No, just in just something in where you say, I would never um, have imagined 20 years ago when I started cooking that I yeah. would do this yeah. particular thing. I think the highlight is that basically I came to work for Mandarin Oriental and where there's just a great collaboration between them and me, you know, the luxury brand and me. And I think that that was the time where things really took shape. You know, they gave me a brilliantly designed restaurant uh, by Adam Tihani. They gave me the tools and means to, to be what we are today. You know, it's, it's, you know, you can see it on a daily basis every day, a restaurant opening with ambition, but do they have the willpower and the desire to be the best and, and also the, the funds to be the best, you know, because it's an expensive journey. Who would you say um, your contemporaries or your peers are in terms of... In the city sort of or level? just internationally? Internationally, I think, um, I think you have no competition in the city. Well, I think, I think it's very difficult because then you will come to the point probably of how can you grow in the rating of the 50 best. And I always... <laughs> You're not allowed to take my questions away, Richard. <laughs> that, is, that is not, that is not uh, truly, that does not preoccupy me. And I think that is probably the less, the less sexy part of, of the whole thing, because it's, it's something you totally cannot control. And uh, I think to be already in a list of 50 best is an awesome recognition. You know, this is, you know, imagine with the amount of millions of restaurants that are worldwide in sure. Europe in that very small series. So to be in that, it's already the best thing that can happen to you. So the rating is probably overrated. I think it's, you know, it's, it's very difficult because even within that listing, you know, who decides who is one and two, it's a matter of probably adding up points of votes, but... Um, in your uh, own personal opinion, yeah. who do you think the best chef in the world is? Um, well, I think all the chefs that I have worked for, I consider as the best chefs because they made, for me, the difference in who I am today. So. You know, I work for Guy Savoy, I work for Pierre Gagné, I work for Alain Passat, I work for Robert Kahn. Those people are for me the best chefs because I've really worked with them and I, 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 I you know, they opened their kitchen and, and their knowledge to me. So for me, they, they are my real heroes. So there's no doubt about them that they deserve to be all very high in the list. And the young chefs who go through those brigades now, do you think they're still getting the same um, level of education as you did when you started with them? Um, I think things are changing, but I think also in a positive manner. I, I do not think that everything has improved on the working floor, but I think that there is an access to knowledge these days through social media and books, and uh, that is tremendous, and I think gives people a very quick way of ev you know, uh, evolving. Um, I think it's probably the most exciting time ever, you know. I mean, when I started to work in the kitchen, the chef was in the corner sort of protecting the mixture he was making for his foie gatrine and nobody would get the recipe. That doesn't really exist anymore. So there's a certain transparency that is now in the trade, which actually makes everybody much better on a daily basis. You've said before that Hong Kong's probably one of the toughest cities in the world to, to run a restaurant. Yeah. Do you think um, this new influx of we call them celebrity chefs or whatever. Do you really think that they do Hong Kong a service by coming and then not spending any time here? Um, I think I think it's it's exciting uh, because um, they they choose Hong Kong to open another restaurant. So I think it's also flattering. They see there is a huge potential, huge curiosity in the city towards food. So I think it's great. Um, they need to make sure that there's a very strong team on the floor that is going to sustain the quality that they stand for. Uh, that is not happen everywhere, for sure. Yeah, I think what, sometimes you end up feeling a little bit short-changed because you will go to a restaurant based on a brand, yeah. that chef, and what we get here is not anywhere near what they're delivering in New York no. or London, and it's not really fair. Um, um, 
Yeah, but I think that's the reality of the business. It's also the reality of some of the partners they go in business with that maybe sure. don't have the same breath as a Mandarin Oriental, for example, and the same stamina and desire of, of driving quality. Sure. Um, uh, yeah, but that is how business works. So, um, Well, uh, you know, if you have a look at Robuchon and you look at yeah. Ducasse, and, you know, the teams and the brigades that they have, they are so fiercely loyal and they're, yeah. you know, they're running it almost as if they were... Yep. in Paris or somewhere like that. Yep. So I think if that model's applied, I think then probably our level of cuisine would Im improve. Of course, but that, but that's why there is also successful stories like Robuchon, uh, like Pierre Gagnier, like mm. uh, Anna Lucas. So it's not only, uh, only doom, you know, it's, sure. it's definitely uh, some very successful chef, but is everybody going to be successful? Um, I think seven years ago when it sort of all started, it made me nervous and now I'm like, okay, yeah, it's, it's Bring fine. Them. Bring them on. I mean, you know, I know what it takes to, to keep the Hong Kong guests happy and the energy it takes and the focus it takes. And I'm here full time. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's challenging. So you and need to have somebody that really transpires the philosophy of the chef and the drive to be able to compete within that very, very demanding market. And Hong Kong is going to be the city you stay in? Oh yes, no, no, no doubt to leaving. No. I'm very happy. We have a great relationship, Mandarin Oriental and myself. It, it's it's a great it's a great relationship we have, and not absolutely not looking into uh, moving anywhere. Good. Thank you very much for taking the time. It's always pleasure. a pleasure to chat Thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you. And that's our chat today with Richard Ekebus. We'll see you soon.